Over the past couple of months, I've covered some of the new FPGA dev boards for the Mister. But what you may not realize is that one of these boards now makes it possible for us to put our Mister into a new form factor. This is my DIY Mister handheld, and today I'm going to walk you through how it works. We've had lots of excitement in the Mr. community this past year in 2024, and rightfully so, because we've had two separate companies create an affordable alternative to the DE10 Nano. One of these companies, QM Tech, put 128 megabytes of SD RAM directly in the FPGA dev board, and that eliminates the need for the bulky add-on memory module. After I spent some time with this board and examined it more closely in my QM Tech deep dive video, I realized that it not only offers a slimmer footprint, but it also consumes 15% less power and has an FPGA with a higher thermal ceiling. And that's what I thought to myself, you know, this could make for a pretty good handheld. So I decided to see what I could whip up in a short time frame, And three weeks later, I had their first prototype for the DIY Mr. Handheld, which I've been calling the Model 1 or DMH01 for short. Now, what I wanted to do was make something quick and unpolished and then open source it so others could step in and improve on the project. I also wanted to keep the FPGA dev board unmodified, so anyone who built one of these wouldn't be stuck with it. If they wanted to, they could take out the FPGA dev board and put it into a different Mr. setup. And since this is a portable game system, I wanted to make it as thin as possible with as much battery life as I could muster up. And I'm very happy with the results. The DMH01 measures 236 millimeters in length, is 102 millimeters tall, and 28 millimeters thick. It weighs in at about a half a kilogram, making it about 65% heavier than a DMG model Game Boy. And the weight's distributed pretty well, making it comfortable to hold for long periods of time. And despite it being fully 3D printed, it doesn't at all feel cheap or flimsy. In fact, since I built this, it's become my number one FPGA gaming device. I even prefer using it over my analog pocket. Now, as great as this is, there are plenty of not so great things that need to be improved. And I'll touch more on those as we move along. But first, let's take a closer look at some of the hardware that I packed into this plastic shell. When you look at the DMH01, one of the first things that sticks out is the five inch display. This screen has a native resolution of 800 by 480, giving it an odd five to three aspect ratio. But despite that, the picture isn't bad, though I have found that the screen does pick up scratches pretty easily. I did look at some screens with a 4 to 3 aspect ratio, but I ended up using this particular display because it checked three major boxes for me. It has native HDMI input, it has a way for me to easily pull HDMI audio out of it, and it runs off of 5 volts DC. Sitting next to the screen, you may notice some familiar buttons. These buttons are from a real Super Famicom controller. To harvest them, a Super Famicom controller needs to be cut down and have wires soldered directly to the traces. Despite it being the actual controller, the shift register is removed during the build, so it doesn't use the controller's native protocol. Instead, there's an Atmel-based microcontroller running a modified version of the Daemon Byte code. Each button connects to a pin on this MCU and the microcontroller appears like a standard USB controller to the Mr. I didn't test the actual latency, but the translation layer is quite thin, so you should be able to enable fast polling. Looking at the backside of the handheld, you'll find my favorite feature, a slot for an NFC card. I covered the Tap2 project a couple of months ago, and I use it so much that I couldn't imagine making a Mr. handheld without one. 
Now, if you weren't aware, the Tap2 project was recently rebranded to Zapparoo, but I'm not going to use the trademarked Zapparoo branding on the open source files. So I've kept the Tap2 logo on the card slot. NFC really adds an element of magic to the whole experience, and it makes it feel much more like a traditional handheld game system. Opening up the shell, you'll see the NFC reader located on the right side of the system. It's mounted right up against the back panel, so the NFC card is brought close to the reader when it's in the slot. On the left side of the system, you'll find an 18.5 watt LiPo battery pack. One of my earlier prototypes actually had a 29.6 watt battery, but after I added the shoulder buttons, I could no longer fit it in. Rather than increase the size of the case, I decided to downsize the battery. Even though it could be larger, 18 and a half watt hours gives you a good two to three hours of playtime, depending on which core you're using and what you have the screen brightness set to. The battery is charged using this USB-C port on top. The USB-C cable plugs directly into this little board, which serves as both a charge controller and a boost converter. Unfortunately, there's no visible battery status indicator, so you don't really know how much juice is left in the battery at any given time. There is a battery life LED array on the charge controller, but you don't normally see it because it's inside the shell. If you look at the top of the device, you can see a light around the edge of the USB-C port. When the battery gets low, this light will start blinking. At that point, there's about 10 minutes of battery life left, so this at least serves as some sort of visual cue to plug it into a charger. But before you do, you'll want to save your game, because when you connect or disconnect a power source, the device unfortunately reboots. This happens because the FPGA dev board is drawing a lot of current, and when the switchover between the battery and the power adapter occurs, there's a short window where not enough current is provided to keep the handheld running. I tried a bunch of different charging modules and even attempted to decouple it with three farads of capacitors, but none of it helped. I do have a couple of ideas on how to resolve this, but it will require a bit of redesign. So for right now, you'll want to save your game before connecting or disconnecting your charger. And if you're settling in for a longer gaming session, then you'll want to plug in the handheld ahead of time. Sitting next to the power module is a stereo amplifier with a built-in volume dial. This module is powered off 5 volts, and HDMI audio is fed in directly from the display. The master volume needs to be turned up in the Mr. Menu, and you can then adjust the actual volume physically with the dial on top. You'll find two 1 watt front facing speakers providing stereo audio, and they can get quite loud. One thing missing, however, is an external facing headphone jack. It would be tempting to wire one to the 3.5mm jack on the display, but you wouldn't have a way to control the volume if you did that. And that's because the buttons for the display's controls aren't accessible when the device is closed up. Technically, this isn't difficult. All you need to do is wire up some tack switches to the display's buttons in parallel. However, finding a spot for them on the case is easier said than done. Maybe someone in the community will want to take this on and try to fit all five of the screen's buttons into the case. But for now, I've been able to live with the preset screen controls. The only time it's been slightly annoying is when playing in the dark because you can't turn down the brightness. This other board here is a USB 2.0 hub. There are two USB ports on the top, so you can plug in accessories like a Wi-Fi dongle or an external controller. In addition, the USB connections for the NFC reader and the built-in controller are hardwired into the USB hub directly. The uplink for this hub is plugged into the USB port on the QM Tech FPGA dev board. As I take out the QM Tech board, You'll notice that the screen is powered from the 5 volt JST header that you would normally plug a fan into. To connect the system buttons and give the board power, I'm using a small female header that plugs into GPIO1. You'll also notice that there's no active cooling. Instead, I've attached an array of copper heatsinks to the FPGA. While this keeps the device silent, it 
does get a little warm after playing for a while. I don't believe it's near the FPGA's thermal ceiling, but if I could fit a fan into this form factor, I would have preferred it. The vents cut out in the rear of the device do help dissipate the heat, so it doesn't warp the 3D printed shell and it never gets too hot to hold, even after a couple of hours. If you do get tired of holding it in your hands, you can set it down into this stand. And if you plug in a power cable and connect a wireless controller, it serves as a comfortable tabletop setup for extended gaming sessions. I recently visited family across the country for the Thanksgiving holiday here in the US and took the handheld mister with me. One evening, my brother-in-law and I connected two USB controllers and played through the Simpsons arcade game. You might think a couple of guys huddled around a small screen wouldn't be very comfortable, but aside from Fred sticking his snout into our business, it actually worked out quite well. All right, let's switch gears for a moment and talk about where I'd like to see this project go moving forward. As I mentioned at the beginning of this video, I'm open sourcing the initial design. I placed all the files and instructions for building a DMH01 in GitHub and the link to the repo is in the description below. I'd love to see others in the community jump into this, build one and improve on the design. That said, it's not an easy build. It requires some advanced soldering skills and a bit of electronics know-how. I am working on a detailed build video that'll walk you through the process step by step. That video is almost done, so consider subscribing and turning on notifications if you want to know when that goes live. I'm far from done with this project. There's a lot about this that can be improved, but we have to start somewhere, and I'm hoping that the DMH01 can serve as a foundation to build upon. If you end up building one of these, let me know in the comments and tag me on X if you post any photos. All right, that's all I have for today. So, as always, until next time, go make something cool.